Hello, Houston. We were um, partway through discussing communication last time. We started out with Bale's interaction process analysis. And today what we're going to do is to jump right into looking at communication networks and look specifically at a very interesting procedure that was done by um, Levitt some years ago involving one of two different types of, um, of um, communications that may be involved. And open communication is basically um, one that, that talks about what can occur. That is, a, an open communication enables all sorts of, of exchange of ideas. By contrast, a closed communication basically kind of limits what might occur. That is, it, it, it frustrates what might occur. Uh, so in general, what we're looking for is a more open form of communication in most organizations. One of the early clever studies of this involves some work done by Levitt, um, in which what he did was to put people on chairs separated by walls, where those walls would permit you in some cases to pass a communication card to other people, and in other cases it wouldn't. The basic idea was that five people in a group were each given a card that had a number on it. And so that card, the, the assignment for the group was to try and solve the number, to try, try and add up the numbers on the card. In other words, get all the cards to one person. The problem was that all you had was a slot through which you could communicate with other people. If you were lucky, you had four slots, like the number three person in, in the center group on the bottom there, but there were a variety of other possibilities that might also exist. When we look at these kinds of, of uh, communication networks, the circle group turns out to have the most messages of all, and yet the members on average are most happy. So any, any given member of a circle group can communicate with any two others, and there's no limit as, as to how many messages can be sent or who, who you might communicate with. It's also clear there is no clearly pronounced leader in that kind of an organization. And that turns out to be what causes the messages to chase each other around. So three might communicate with four, and then four communicates back with three, and, and the message spends a lot of time just moving back and forth and may not clearly end up all the cards in one person's hand for many, many moves. But at least the members have a ball in doing so. The second possibility is instead to look at the wheel group, the center bottom one I was just referring to. That one generates the fewest messages. What it also does is to lead to the quickest solution. It also illustrates the primary things about this system that I wanted to describe to you. The one is that the, the number three player in the wheel group here has what is called the most centralized position of all. And centrality turns out to be one of the two important things in terms of predicting which network will work best under which kind of conditions. So in essence, number three in the wheel group among the five groups we've got here has the most centralized position in the, um, of, of anybody in these various networks. When we rate centrality and when we rate satisfaction, both of those turn out to be highly correlated. That is, number three in the wheel group is more satisfied with his position than anybody else in any of the other groups. So essentially, centrality tends to be highly correlated with satisfaction. Doesn't always lead to the best group for all situations, as we'll see here. Another possibility is the Y group. The Y group has the fewest errors. Um, and number three is happiest within that group. But it is also accompanied by number five, who is the least happy among anyone in any of the groups. So in essence, some of the organizations, and you can obviously see why, because number five can only communicate with number four in the Y organization. And um, it is also possible that um, if number four doesn't happen to like number five, nobody ever hears from him or her at all. So in, in essence, being that isolated leads to a highly unhappy member, because at some level they begin to understand that they get word very late, uh, they don't impact the group solution much, and so forth. Another possibility is the free group. Um, each member averages happiest in this situation, even more so than the, than the average among the wheelers, um, as we'll describe them for purposes of, of uh, accurate identification. The free group is the kind that you would want to have in a social situation. The University of Houston, by contrast, is organized as a wheel, as are most major organizations. Um, and when the current chancellor president came in, word was sent down through channels that you were to stay in channels. You, meaning members of the organization, were to stay in channels. 
<coughs> and so in the limited instances when people used to be able to go in and see the president, now the response was that unless it was a presidential level problem, you were referred down um, to the provost or the dean or your department chair, wherever the actual solution to that particular problem resided. And so in essence, with this kind of an organization, top-down management very much wants to keep all the workers in channels. That's a very easy and obvious control strategy. The obvious way to mess that up is to get out of channel. Um, many years ago, we had a problem with the lighting and many other things, and Agnes Arnold and I sent in memo after memo to try and get it fixed, the, the lecture hall fixed, and I kept getting back very nice memos from the vice president then of facilities planning congratulating me for all sorts of detailed suggestions. It was ultimately submitted as a minor capital improvement, and nothing was done the same year the dean's offices in several instances got carpets. So I figured the time had come for a public protest, which we mounted. What we did was go out and have a protest on the front lawn of the administration building where I had a jack-up lab stool from which I could lecture. I had a bullhorn that, that the lecture notes could be enunciated from, uh, and a number of people had created posters and so forth. And the net result was that the institution sent its provost out to talk to me um, and assure me that things were being done to fix the problems, and I could be seen when, when one of the channels was interviewing us in the background, shaking my head no as he's saying that. Um, the students invited him over to the lecture hall uh, to see what was going on, and at that time the air conditioning didn't work well, it was real rank, but the, um, the director of media um, indicated that um, they had just fixed the, the slide projector that I've been asking for, so they put that on, Big round of applause and the slide fried right in front of everybody because in the rush to put it in, what they had done was to forget to put the condenser lenses in which absorbed the heat. So the slide fried right there in front of 500 students and the provost and me. And that summer they did $33,000 worth of repairs, which is the reason that the lights now can be shut off progressively from the front to the back in those two auditoria. It came originally from a student riot. Um, so the way you get out of a, a wheel organization is to raise hell outside the ladder chain, and it works. The squeaky wheel does get the grease in that kind of a situation. Finally, then, you can look at the chain, um, which is the second largest number of, of messages that are generated in, in that condition, and it has the three happiest members, two, three, and four. Uh, so any degree of centrality tends to lead to a higher degree of satisfaction. But strictly for organizational problem-solving purposes, you want a wheel group. On the other hand, if you're in a social group, you'd rather have the, the free arrangement. If you're in a fraternity or a sorority, you want to feel comfortable going to talk to the president of the group and not, a, not give a second thought to it, and nobody would. If you jumped around the vice president of whatever and instead um, um, talk directly to the to the president, but a free situation works fine in in a um, in a social situation. So in essence, the the um, the two major principles, as we've already talked about them, there are centrality. Uh, higher centrality then is related to higher satisfaction. A certain degree of centralization of function is necessary in a problem solving uh, situation. One of the things that comes out of this is roles. Roles basically involve the pattern of behavior that is expected from you and I because of the position that we have in a particular group. And that leads into some rather interesting kinds of, of findings in general. One of the things is that there are a lot of different roles that you and I actually play. One is that you and I are saddled with oftentimes what are called multiple roles. Um, I'm the leader the lecturer, the discussant, the, the chair of the group here, but if you happen to be in charge of a, a Sunday school class or, or a class at your synagogue or something like that, there you're the leader. So in essence, each of us, as we move into different arenas, tend to play different roles depending on, on what our purpose is, what, why we're in the particular group we're in. So we have multiple roles. That in turn will also facilitate sometimes what is called out-of-role behavior. One example of this will surprise you, but 25 years ago, before the first gas crises in the mid-1970s, this was a classic example of out-of-role behavior. And to show you how much things have changed, there were classes that I taught in the mid-1970s when, when a picture like this came up, you literally could hear an inhale from the members of the audience as in, <gasps> because it was so atypical for a woman to pump gas. And in fact, at that time, the reason they were called service stations was because, in fact, they used to offer service. That is, they would come out while they were pumping the gas and check your oil, put water in the, in the window washer, and so forth. Um, when the gas prices went up, the number of employees was, was reduced, and the net result was that, that um, 
we all ended up pumping gas ourselves. Nowadays, if you stop in at your local uh, gas station, it's just it's 50-50 as to whether the man or the woman will pump gas, and, and you know the other will head to the cash register to deal with the, the money. But in fact, uh, that's a, a behavior that is no longer considered out of role at all because we've gone to so many of the, of the self-service uh, gas stations. But that was an example at one time of out of role behavior. And the other one is role conflict that we can get into sometimes. Um, when John Kennedy ran for president, he was the first Catholic who had ever been nominated for major political office by either party. And one of the things that he was constantly dealing with on the campaign trail was role conflict. Because as a Catholic, one of the questions that was asked of him, not only in the newspapers but also in person, was, if we have to go to war, who are you going to respond to, the pope who says don't or the people who think you should? And the obvious answer that he gave was, well, I'll respond to the, to the public. Um, but in essence, what he was trying to handle there was a problem of role conflict. The people were having difficulty envisioning a then never before seen Catholic president um, who might have some degree of sensed responsibility to the, um, to the pope as, um, in, under certain contexts. Um, so role conflict is another of the things that, that evolves out of this. Now. What come out of roles and the way in which we behave is what are called norms. Norms are essentially much more empirically established. These are standards that often are defined as normal, meaning average. Okay? I'll give you an example of one. What do we normally do when we get in an elevator? There are two things that you always do when you get in an elevator. What are they? Number one, go you for it. Face the door. Okay, so you turn around. First thing you do when you get on an elevator is turn around. Somebody else, what's another thing you do? Press the button. Yeah, you press the button. Now, interestingly enough, there's a third behavior that we also engage in, which is goofy, but we do it. You ever notice when people get in the elevator, they look up to check and see what floor the elevator is on? You think about that, that is really dumb behavior. Because if the elevator isn't on the floor you're on, you're dead, and it doesn't matter because you've just stepped into a gigantic hole. But we all do it. We get in, we check, yeah, it's on eight, I'm on eight, so we're okay. Um, but the two things that we always do are get on and face the front. What would happen, wondered the people at Candid Camera, if when the doors opened, everybody was facing the back? In other words, what you would see is this. What do you do under that circumstance? Well, they ran that as an experiment uh, and, and actually did it as a very entertaining TV show. We replicated it using the eight floor uh, elevators in the library, on the, in the main, uh, on the main library, on the main campus here at the U of H. Um, and in essence, these are some of the possibilities. One possibility is to get on and face the front. This is the only group of people who made comments like, this must be a psychology experiment. Okay, it's the only group that would comment like that. The second possibility is to get on and face the side. You feel stupid, but at least you get there. The third possibility is to get on and face the back because now you can no longer keep your eye on the crazy people and still watch the floor at the same time. Um, but, and you're conforming completely, but again, you're getting there. And the fourth possibility is no thanks, I'll, I'll wait for the next car. Which would you do by show of hands? How many of you would get on and face the front? Okay. How about get on and face the side? Okay. Get on and face the back? Conform, but at least you get there. And how many would simply wait for the next car? Okay, so the most popular vote was to get on and face the front. The second most popular was to wait for the next car. Both of you are wrong. All of you are wrong. You are wildly wrong. Okay, the actual answer was, in terms of those who actually got on and faced the front, only 18% did so. Okay, less than one in five, a little more than one in six would actually get on and face the front a whopping 63% got on and faced sidewards. Sidewards, that was by far the most popular option. Not one that anybody opted for in here, I noticed. Sorry, I guess there were one or two that did. Six people faced the back, and 12% said, uh, no, I'll wait for the next car. But that means in that case, what you've got is the consequences of a violation of norms. <laughs> That is, by having everybody facing the back, that was not what people expected when the elevator doors opened. And the result was they violated the norms also. That is, if you look at the data, five out of six across 200 people 
did other than the normal expected behavior in the elevator. And I know that's the normal expected behavior because this same group of people rode up and down the elevator another 200 times facing the front and counted only instances where somebody got on who did not know any of the five and got on alone. And in that instance, 99% of the time, people got on and faced the front. And the only other alternative was two people who were so deeply engrossed in the book they were reading that they got on and got about halfway turned around. They were kind of facing the side, and they rode all the way down or up, whichever it was, um, just reading the book. So by far, the norm is to get on and face the front. We don't do that when people are facing the side of the back. You and I are very sensitive to norms. And, and we follow them. And if they get violated by people, we then also tend to, to violate those norms ourselves. Now, in turn, what the norms lead to is power and influence, particularly as reflected in things like status. This leads to one of my all-time favorite experiments. Um, this is a position representing differences, basically in the dispensing of power is what we're dealing with. Whether it's money in a corporation or, or uh, influence in a political organization, high status is someone who has a lot of whatever the corporation or company or group deals in to dispense or give away. The means of assignment for high status positions is normally either ascribed to people, that is uh, assigned to people, or in other instances you achieve it, that is you earn it. This next study is an animal study that involves the study of the establishment of social class. And I think ultimately uh, this is an achieved status of inferiority. Watch it develop. In this case, what we have is essentially a structure of subgroups within a society. And you'll see that evolve here in just a second. This was actually a rat study. Um, what they did in this particular study, it was conducted by O. Hobart Maurer at the University of Illinois. What Maurer did was to alter the standard Skinner box in one way. Instead of having both the bar and the food cup in the same position, what he did was to put the bar at one end of the box and the food cup at the other end of the box. So the training of the rats took a little bit longer, but in essence they were fairly easily trained to bar press at one end and then walk up to the other end uh, to get the, the food that was necessary. Three rats were trained this way. So each of three rats was trained to press the bar at one end, walk to the other end to get the, um, to get the food. Now, all three rats are put in the box together. And the question was, what would happen? Well, what happened was they cooperated. The one rat would press the bar and then would cycle around to go get the food. And the, third, the second one who had just finished eating the food would step away from the box and be headed back to the bar to press the, pallet, the, the bar again. And in fact, it worked this way. They cycled for a number of trials. Each would press, walk around to eat, go back around to, to bar press while chewing, and so forth. All of a sudden, one of the rats wised up, if you want to label it that way, and probably said to himself something like, and I'm being anthropomorphic here, this is dumb. Press once and do all this walking for one lousy pellet of food. I'm going to press 43 times, so there is a large group of pellets there when I get there. And so he sat there and bar pressed multiple times. What did two other rats learn at exactly that moment? Yeah, that they don't have to bar press. And the net result was that what that one poor sucker did by deciding he was going to beat the system, right? I'm going to press it a bunch of times. What he did was perpetually put himself into the working class. And in that particular setup, from that point onward, the other two rats never again touched the bar, OK? I think about that sometimes when I'm driving into work and wonder if I pressed the bar too many times sometime early in my, um, in my career. But in essence, what's happened there is that, that as soon as the, the, the two rats learn that they don't have to press the bar anymore, they never do. They immediately assign themselves into the leisure class. And from that point onward, it's only the worker bee, the worker rat, who presses the bar from that point onward. I find that a very disturbing study to, to think about. Now, let's look at interpersonal attraction. Um, as, as a kind of a, a segue into a very different kind of, of topic here. Um, interpersonal attraction essentially has to do with um, how we go about seeking gratification from people. And there are a lot of different ways in which that gratification can be achieved. That is, there are different reasons why we associate and are attracted to particular people. In one case, they serve intellectual stimulation. They introduce new ideas, new activities into our lives. And we may like them or be attracted to those kind of people for that kind of a, a purpose. The second possibility is, is utility value. 
Um, I once had a friend who was invaluable to me in, in uh, helping to reconstruct the, the um, fixer-upper house that I bought about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, and he was very free of his time. And you know, you try to reciprocate as best you can in offering up your time in, under similar uh, circumstances. But that was a person, a friend, who had a great deal of utility value to me. And hopefully, I offered some to him in, in return. Um, the third type is, is basically the type that, that just supports your ego. It's somebody that is sympathetic to you, who encourages you, who supports you, um, who, uh, around whom you feel good, who appreciates you and, and who approves of the kind of things that you, uh, that you do. Now, in essence, there was a study done of interpersonal attraction. And this original study was done by Walston, Aarons, Aronson, Abrams, and, and Rotman. Um, in a, what has become a classic study. Uh, it was done at the University of, of Minnesota during registration. Back at the time this study was originally conducted, registration was a very simple process. Most universities did it, do it, did it. We used to do it over in, in Hofheinz Pavilion. Um, what would happen is an IBM card would be printed for each seat in a classroom. So if a department had a class, and it was a 30-seat room, there'd be 30 IBM cards, and you, you registered for the class by simply walking around Hofheinz Pavilion, or in this case at the University of Illinois, around their basketball arena. And so you went to English and got a card for 1303, you went to psychology and got one for 1300, and math for 1301, and so forth. Um, and that's the way you registered. So if you had five cards, you had five seats guaranteed in the classroom. They didn't oversubscribe because they didn't give away more cards than they had seats. Very simple. Well, in this case, what they decided to do was to announce a computer dance. So in, right in the place where everybody had to walk through to give back their cards, turn them in for purposes of being billed and so forth, they put up a great big display that said on it kind of like what's on the screen here now, computer dance. Tell us about yourself. Let the computer select your partner. One dollar. And in essence, you were, if, you, if you paid the dollar, you were given about an eight, a six or eight page form to fill out about yourself. While you were filling it out, four campus studs and studettes, if we can use those terms, rated your physical attractiveness on a, uh, on a 10 point scale from, from, um, from one to 10, okay? Um, actually, it was a nine point scale, one to nine. Um, higher number, more attractive. Lower number, more help you need. Eight pages worth of information and this rating was collected. They did, in fact, use the computer, as was promised in, in the promo, to, to select the partners, but none of the data that was collected. I mean, the implication was I've given you eight pages of information about my height, my weight, my race, my sex, my political leanings, my religious preferences, on and on and on. Um, none of that was used to make the assignment. What they did was to tell the computer one thing, and that is any female must be shorter than the male with whom she is paired. But beyond that, then, they simply took a male and noted his weight and selected a matching partner from him randomly from among all the females who were his height or, or his height or shorter. And that was all. So in essence, you might have had a seven foot basketball player matched up with a four foot six um, freshman um, female. It could have happened. Uh, but it was purely a random dating process, or matching process. The dates, that is, the, the information was exchanged by mail uh, so that everybody was informed who the computer had selected for them. And in fact, the computer did select, um, but by no means using all the information. The dance was held. So this was done in early September. The dance was held in late September. At halftime at the dance, well, let's say at the intermission of the dance, each person who was at the dance was given the questionnaire again and asked to fill out that about their partner. It was a kind of an informal, well, actually a formalized measure of how much information had exchanged hands at that point. That is, how much had you learned about your partner in the, in the intervening time between being matched and then being, um, um, and then being um, at the dance and so forth. The data was all packed away and four to six months later, um, these investigators tracked down about 70% of the, of the original 376 couples that had, been, um, that had been created. They tracked down about 75% uh, of, 70 75% of them. And they asked them a series of questions. These were the dependent variables. They were asked, among other things, um, did you date any more? If so, who initiated the date? And how many such dates did you have? OK? And that was the, the dependent variable. That was correlated against all of the information that had originally been collected. There was one variable that actually predicted the likelihood that additional dates would occur. Do you know what it was? Rated physical attractiveness. That was the only variable that actually predicted 
who would be likely to date whom. It also predicted not only, that is, what I'm saying is, the higher the average um, couple score, the more likely it was that that couple would date again, and it also correlated positively with the number of additional dates they would have. So the higher the average rated physical attractiveness of the couple, the greater the likelihood they would meet again. It also worked within couples, and that is essentially, uh, if a six was randomly paired with a nine, it was much more likely that six would call nine to initiate additional dates than it was that nine would call six. So the average rated attractiveness um, also worked within couples in addition to uh, across couples. Now, in essence there, um, what we're dealing with then is the importance of physical attractiveness. And there turn out to be several different explanations as to why this kind of an effect um, actually might, um, might have presented itself. One is essentially the, the physical attractiveness stereotype, and that is that what's beautiful must be good. Okay? Um, that certainly works well in, in jury settlements. If you are an attractive person, you are much more likely to win in, in a contested jury trial than if you're an ugly person. Okay? Secondly, the assumption is that attractive people are better able to reward you. Whether that's true or not is, is an empirical separable question, but in, in essence it is, it is true. Uh, that is the second factor that seems to be operating here. And the third is essentially some elements of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that is that, that um, uh, we just tend to think that attractive people are more attractive, are more interesting, are more this, are more that. Interesting side study was, was published several years, many years after this particular study. Um, a group at the University of Maryland studied attractive men and women. And what they discovered was that attractive women particularly are, are irked more easily than the average woman and, and less well, less, less well endowed women, less beautiful women. Um, the point there for both males and females was that attractive people tend to get their way. They tend to be catered to, you know, if, if there are four people across the front of a counter, most service people will tend to go to the person who is most attractive, whoever it happens to be. And so the net result is that attractive people end up getting used to getting their way more often. And the problem is that they then don't deal as well with the fact that sometimes we all have to deal with frustrations. And so it does turn out that in some instances um, uh, physical attractiveness may have a, a bearing on, on uh, um, how well you'll be able to handle the everyday world. But for the, before those of you who get ugly, who are ugly like I am, get worried about it, let me assure you there are a number of other features that also bear in here. One is physical proximity. This was a kind of an interesting study done at, at uh, MIT right after the Second World War. They had at that time a dorm complex that was isolated uh, on campus that had 17 buildings in it, all of which looked like the one that's on the screen. That is, there were five apartments up and five down with a couple of staircases connecting them. What they did was to go into that dorm complex at the, on the first day of school, that is literally when people were moving in, and ask them to participate in a study where they asked them a series of questions on friendship. And one of the major questions they asked was, who is your best friend? With whom have you spent most of your time over the last week? Then they simply parked the data and they came back in April to the same 17 dorms and asked the residents there again, who's your best friend? With whom have you spent most of your time? And what they were surprised to find was that whereas in the fall, the answers were literally for about people all over the country because MIT is, is a national university. In the fall, I mean in the spring, Imagine their surprise when they discovered what a, what a correlation they'd found. One unit on this study is considered going, one, going next door. So that means two units is going two doors down for your best friend, three and four. The maximum you could do on one floor was four points. The maximum you could do in the dorm was five, and that's all they tallied was just friends that fell under this, under this category. So in essence, in a given dorm, you could rack up as many as five points if you were in the corner bottom room and went to the corner top room at the opposite end of the other floor. And the data was interesting. On the same floor, there was a perfect linear correlation between how far you had to walk and the likelihood that somebody would become your best friend. Okay, Next door neighbors had over a two in five shot at being your best friend after a year. We don't like to work very hard to go see our best friends, is quite clear. But the question then is why that might be the, uh, the case. And in essence, there, there are several different answers that are, that are available here. One is simply availability. The people who are closest to you, you are most likely to know whether are home or not, whether they're in a receptive mood and so forth. Um, there is secondly the idea that you have the expectation of continued interaction with them, so you might as well get to know them. And in most cases, as we get to know people, they become more interesting, they become a better friend, and so forth. The third is that the more you're with or near people, 
the more predictable their behavior becomes. They're, they are more predictable and, and um, um, easier to get along with. The fourth is, is familiarity. Familiarity does breed comfort. There is no doubt about it. Uh, that's one of the reasons that, that uh, cola products advertise themselves as much as they do. They are trying to just drill that name into us as many times as possible so that when you get to the counter, you ask for that product by name. Um, and that simply is familiarity breeds not contempt but comfort in most instances. And so that's a, a fourth reason why physical proximity might be an important um, feature leading to the establishment of interpersonal attraction, a great basis for interpersonal attraction. Another is people who like us. We tend to prefer people who like us. This is one of the most devastating studies that was ever done. It was such a neat lie. Um, two people were brought into the laboratory and told that they were going to be working on a cooperative project for seven days. This would have been perfect for you with up to seven points optional. One hour a day, you're going to work with this person. Before the experiment started, the experimenter was in talking to the person next door, your partner. You were going to do something and then pass it through the wall. They would work on it a while, send it back to you, and so forth. They talked to the other person a little bit about you, about the research, about everything. On day one, you could hear through the wall that person making a series of very positive or very negative comments about you. That, it turns out, was the independent variable which was being applied. You didn't know it because the researcher then came in and talked to you about the same kind of things. But over the course of seven days, what happened was one of two things. Either the comments always were made very positive or very negative, or they changed. So that what happened was that they switched. And if, if the person had originally been saying very nice things about you, they started gradually saying more and more negative things about you. And that's what's diagrammed on the, on the page here, is what ha on, the, on the screen, is what happens to those um, um, uh, comments over the seven days. At the end of seven days, you were asked, among other things, to rate the person with whom you'd been working. There are two things I want to point out to you here. Obviously, the later rating is the best predictor of how well you like the person with whom you worked. But there is buried within those ratings a sub-factor, which is also important to note. If you notice, if they liked you at the beginning and, you liked, and they liked you at the end, you like them. But if they didn't like you at the beginning and they do like you now, you really like them. Okay. On the other end, it's even more heavy-handed. If they didn't like you at the beginning and they don't like you now, you're not too wild about them. But if they did like you at the beginning and they don't like you now, you actively hate them. You really dislike them. So it isn't just the final rating that is important. It's the history of how you got to that final rating that also governs the nature of the feeling that you, that you, um, that you hold for people. The optimistic note to read into this is that what this is really arguing is that in most social relationships, the, the peaks and valleys that you experience are not necessarily bad. That is, building yourself out of the valleys is a strengthening effect uh, on, the, on the nature of the relationship. But of course, understand it's a person who's twice divorced who's telling you this. So you may want to consider the source there. Now, when we look at um, another one is people who agree with us, which I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on. But let's look at the process of falling in love. This has generated a whole lot of theories down through the, um, down through the years. One of these is a levels of contact theory developed originally by Levenger. Levenger's model argues that basically what you have is, is a person and, and an organization, uh, where that organization may be reflected in the boss or any of a variety of other things. But what happens if the relationship progresses is that you move gradually through a series of stages until you and the organization or the boss are as one with each other. That is, the working relationship becomes stronger and stronger. This theory was also applied to the process of falling in love in a rather interesting way. And somebody looked at these, this graph and had the same kind of very intense ho-hum reaction to it that you just had and provided for me a series of photographic uh, essay, a photo essay illustrating the process of falling in love. Stage one is what we call zero contact, total strangers passing each other on the street. That is followed by unilateral awareness, the who was that masked man phenomenon. Okay? Now one party is aware of the other. Here's a case where physical attractiveness definitely plays a role. Okay, Then, after unilateral awareness, you now experience surface contact. At this point, he initiates a reason for meeting her. He bumps into her as she's uh, entering the laundry room as he's, she's, as he's exiting, causing her to drop her clothes basket, which gives him the excuse to come back around and say, how absolutely clumsy of me. Here, let me help you pick up your bras, your panties, and by the way, what's your name? And so forth. This, in turn, leads to minor mutuality things like a Coke date. 
That's where you run the script about your height, your weight, your major, your religious preference, your political preference, the things that we can do with our eyes shut at cocktail parties without any problem at all. This, in turn, if it's progressing, leads to major mutuality. Now she's sitting in his apartment reading a book on nonverbal communication with just a little bit of underwear showing. So there are several different levels of communication going on. And if you're lucky, the final result is total unity. It happens. It does happen. Now, basically the levels that he's talking about here are several fold. And you can see the kind of parallel uh, to, to the industrial worker thing that I was talking about before. But it's a very interesting theory in terms of kind of <coughs> recognizing that physical attractiveness is very important at, you know, at the level of unilateral awareness. But by the time you shift from major mutuality into total unity, um, now things like values and attitudes are becoming much more and ultimately all important in terms of what ultimately folds out here. This was the work of Levenger. There's another group of studies that were done by Rubin involving trying to respond directly to the question, what is love? What he did was to advertise widely in, in undergraduate schools um, uh, to find people who were in long-term relations. Didn't matter whether they were married or not. But he asked them over the course of many months a huge, long series of questions that looked at many different aspects of what's meant by, by love. And what he found was that when he analyzed the data, there were three elements that, that most often tended to show up. One is attachment a physical emotional bond linking you to that other person or organism or thing, a desire to possess and be fulfilled by that other individual. The second is caring. You think about the people for whom you would say, I'd give my life for, and that is a very short list for most of us, okay? And thirdly then, intimacy, an intense bond. That is often illustrated, for instance, by shared or simultaneous thoughts where in a, in a party situation, you turn to your, your significant other, your now significant other, and make a comment that is totally off the wall relative to what's going on right there. But it illustrates shared thoughts, which is one of the, the common elements of, of, um, um, of the, the um, identification of, of love. Interestingly, Rubin came, Rubin came back several years later, in fact, about 20 years later, and wrote a very interesting article raising an interesting ethical issue. He tried to track down about 10 years after this study was done, um, and what he found was that among the 20 or 25 percent of the couples he could still track down, about 80 percent of them had fallen apart directly as a result of participating in this study which raises a very interesting ethical issue. And that is, was the cost of the knowledge that was gained from that study worth the cost of destroying four out of five couples who went through it? Now, the defense that he offered, and it was really only a defense, uh, was to suggest that the vast majority of people basically argued that they, uh, when they looked at it afterwards, were in lust rather than in love. And that as they looked at all the different things that went into love, they began to realize as they looked at the questionnaire, well, I'm not really in love. Uh, and that that was the basis that they cited for actually falling apart, for actually separating from the person they were with at the time. But it does raise a very interesting kind of challenging issue. Robert Sternberg offers a triarchic theory of love in which he argues that there are three parts. One is passion. That's basically the human sexuality aspects of, of, um, of love, the, the physical, the, the carnal aspects of, of sex and, and love. Um, a passion-based romance is one that is, well, a, a Saturday, a one-night stand is an example of that. Summer camp romances are heavy on passion and not much else, usually. Intimacy is the second element. This is the person, and, and intimacy-based romance is one where you're always a bridesmaid, never a bride, always a groomsman, never a groom, okay? The, who's, everybody's your best friend. Uh, that's an intimate-based relationship that's based primarily on friendship rather than sex. And thirdly, commitment. Commitment is illustrated, among other things, by the marriage ceremony where we stand up in front of an authority figure and acknowledge to love, honor, cherish, and till death do us part, and so forth. Um, insurance payments, savings for a child's education are all examples of commitment. If you're lucky, you have all three. One of the things that makes Sternberg's theory a particularly interesting one is that you can have a love based on any one, any two, or if you're lucky, all three of those things. If the relationship starts to fall apart, which departs? Passion, intimacy, or commitment? Passion, yes. What drops second? Intimacy. And in some instances, people stay together for the kids, which is a mistake. 
Uh, kids know when it's not a good relationship, and, and doing that out of a sense of commitment is, is not widely recommended these days. But older people will sometimes slip into a relationship which is companionate rather than passionate, if we could say it that way. And that's perfectly healthy. I mean, that's, that's a good progression for, you know, people who've been married 50, 55, 60 years to be simply very solid companions for one another. So the, the thing that makes um, Sternberg's a rather intriguing theory um, is the idea that um, you don't necessarily have to, to engage in all you don't have to have all three components in order to, um, um, in order to um, um, necessarily have a good, solid, love-based relationship. I'm skipping ahead here a little bit because in the interest of time, I do want to cover some of the things that we're uh, not otherwise going to have time to talk about. So we're going to actually jump ahead into the, um, the next section dealing with um, attitudes because there's some information in there that I want to, um, that I want to share with you. Um, so now, when we look at, um, when we look at attitudes, I can show you a number of different examples of, of attitudes. I hate doing homework is an attitude. I am stuck on band-aids and band-aids stuck on me, which was one of their old uh, themes, is trying to shape nothing but an attitude toward band-aid as, as a product. And in international news, Israel today announced and so forth. Our attitudes toward various countries in various kinds of disagreements uh, is just that. It's an attitude. It's shaped by what news we learn, what biases we carry around with us, and so forth. But attitude is what we're functioning, what we're focusing on here today. And it is a very complex element of how you and I go about um, operating in the everyday world. It is essentially a learned orientation. It does impact a lot of our behavior. And like learning, what I'm going to do is to define it essentially as an intervening variable. That is, there are things we can manipulate on the independent variable side that influence our attitudes, and in the same way, there are attitudes that we can infer from the behaviors that you exhibit. And we can infer what your, what your attitudes are from some of the behaviors that you um, exhibit. That one theme is going to set up most of the rest of the discussions we'll engage in the rest of today and, and in, the, in the final lecture, the next one. Now, one of the classic and one of my all-time favorite experiments involved a license plate study in Tennessee. This was done in a year when George Wallace, uh, Hubert Humphrey, and Richard Nixon were campaigning for the presidency. Okay? It was done way back in, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And in essence, what was involved here was a, a study that was done of license plates and inspection stickers in Tennessee. At that time in Tennessee, you had to have your car inspected during October. Tennessee is about the size of Houston. Uh, and so they just did it all in one month instead of having the, the stations, you know, all year operating. The question then was, what these investigators did at Vanderbilt was to go out into the parking lots of the university there, and they picked up, they identified the political leaning of the owner of the car for any car that had one bumper sticker showing. So if you had Humphrey, you were tallied as a Democrat. If you had Nixon, you were tallied as a, as a Republican. And if you had the Wallace bumper sticker, that was the year that Wallace was running a very strong third-party candidate candidacy, but it was a, a blatantly segregationist ticket that he was doing. But he was doing it under the, the rubric of law and order. That is, we're supposed to obey the laws. Well, the question then was, how well would people obey the laws depending on whether they voted for Wallace or for Humphrey or for Nixon? That is, were they an independent espousing law and order? Were they a Republican or a Democrat? How do you think the Republicans did? What's shown here is the average. Were the Republicans better or worse than average? Better, yes. Actually, they were slightly better. Actually, substantially better. Um, they were up to about 86% as opposed to 81, 82%. How about the Democrats? Did they do better or worse than the Republicans? Identically. Identically. The modal answer there is, oh, worse. How about the people who espoused law and order? much worse than either other group. There's a case where there's, a, you know, this is wrapped up in, there's many a slip twixt cup and lip. In essence, here are people who are espousing law and order, but in fact are clearly not, not having that follow up in their behavior. Yeah, I'm all in favor of law and order, but I'm not gonna have my car inspected when it's required by the state. Is a case where your attitude is one thing, your behavior obviously is quite different. Now, when we look at the components that, that attitudes actually have, there, there are 
at least three different components that we can identify here. Um, the structure of an attitude is largely impacted by the cognitive component, as, as we're going to envision it here. And the cognitive component is impacted basically by your belief or disbelief of a given, um, of a given product. A company that advertises co attacking cognitive beliefs is going to give you data. Ford used to have a truck commercial where they talked about the percentage of Ford trucks that were still on the road uh, after all these years. That's a cognitive approach. Uh, Volvo, with the, they were the first ones to run their car into the brick wall in the safety test that's now done, and they talk about survivability. They're going after the belief-disbelief dimension. The second is the affective dimension, the belief dimension. Here, you're going after like and dislike. The classic commercial for that and the second all-time highest commercial um, was a, a commercial that featured Mean Joe Green, who was a football player for the Pittsburgh Steelers at the time the commercial was done. He came off the field one afternoon with a miserable gray rainy day behind him, mumbling to himself, and blows right past a kid who offers up to him a Coke bottle. It says, want a Coke, mister? That's the only, one of the only words in the entire commercial. He gets past him, turns around and comes back, takes the bottle from his hand, simply tips it up and pours it, the entire thing into his throat, gives the kid the bottle, takes his, his uh, ringing wet jersey off, throws it at the kid, whap, says thanks, and leaves. And in essence, it was purely an affective commercial. The name of the product was there, but that's almost the only print that appears on the entire ad. And it was clearly an attempt to establish a kind of a, a moment, a mood, and to associate it positively with the product. Thirdly, action. When a company says 20% off anything you buy, they are going after couch potatoes. They give a rip whether they're selling the best product. All they're trying to do is to move your fanny from the couch to their store. And in essence, what they're attacking there is your readiness to respond. That's the way you impact um, the action component. In terms of function, there, there are several different elements. And I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to skim this. But there are several different functions that attitudes actually uh, serve for us. Um, let me look then instead about how attitudes are actually formed. They do, first of all, by parents are one major source. One of the best predictors as to who's going to win the presidential election is to ask high school seniors, because they have not separated intellectually from their parents yet, as college students typically have. You guys are now obstreperous at the dinner table. Uh, you used to be submissive when you were still in high school, but there's a big shift that begins to occur in terms of thinking for yourself when you get into, uh, when you get into college. Peers are another major source, and finally then reference groups. Oftentimes, if you're trying to join a group, you will act like that group just so that the similarity of attitude makes you more um, persuasive, uh, more likely to be able to be, more likely for, them, for you to be acceptable to them. Persuasion is where it begins to get interesting, and that is how do we go about changing your attitude? And the answer is there are at least four different things we can use to change your attitude. One is the source itself, uh, and we'll look at each of these at least briefly. Um, the source is one. Here's an impact, uh, a study, based on the credibility of the source, and it illustrates what is called a sleeper effect. I'm not going to give you the details of this study, but in essence, the yellow curve involved a person like uh, Tiger Woods trying to sell you a Chrysler. Tiger Woods doesn't know any more about a Chrysler or a car product or a Buick than you and I do. But he's a very high authority sports figure. And so he has a lot of positive affect. But the sleeper effect on a sports figure's endorsement of a product is downward over time. A person who has no particular credibility, but in the long run gains that credibility, um, um, has a positive sleeper effect. OK? Um, so the high. I blew that, and I knew I was going to. The high creditable source is the one who knows a lot about it, and his impact over time drops. A low credible source grows with time. Okay, so you have a sleeper effect in both instances. I don't want to confuse you on that graph. The high credible source um, drops with time. So what I should have been saying about Tiger Woods is that his impact over time grows. Because he's a low credible source on which car to drive, he would be a high credible source on golf balls. But interestingly enough, in the long run, they both end up with about the same moderate level of impact on, on the likelihood that we'll, um, that we'll buy a product. Um, secondly, then, we can look at the, um, the, um, the message that is actually used. And here, you get some rather interesting effects. How much the, de the message deviates from the beliefs of the people is an inverted U in terms of how much attitude it will change. If you listen to a commercial that you basically believe, you don't pay attention to it. And one that deviates slightly from your views will not change your opinion. In the same way, the Ku Klux Klan never advertises on television because their view is so anathema to the average Americans that it would be of no benefit to them. They would not gain members that way. We would just write them off. So the moderate attitude changes is best. Degree of fear is the same way. 
we want to have a moderate level of arousal, but the problem is if we raise too much fear, if we raise your angst too high, we're going to drive you away by exactly the same logic. Um, when we look at the, the channel, they're very similar. Newspaper is better for detail. Television and radio are better for initially calling attention to an ad. And finally then, the, the recipient, um, that is as rich and diverse as, as, the, um, as the, the, um, the entirety of, of psychology. Um, in terms of the theories of attitudes, which we'll barely start today and pick up on tomorrow, one of the most elementary of these is what's called a balance theory. And as you can see from the figures here, you have a problem on the right when there's, a, when there's an imbalance, a negative balance. We'll pick up on that in the next program.